will you pray with me, please? Holy God, creator of all life, you have called us here offering grace and mercy, a new life. When we have seen nothing, you have given us everything. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we may live in the abundance of your joy, compassion, and peace. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Have you ever been invited to dinner only to find out when you got there you should have asked who else was coming? Or the first person you see is someone you end up thinking to yourself, well, there goes my dinner. I think Jesus put up a lot with that. Not as the one wishing others weren't there, but being part of the crowd others wished weren't there. I think Jesus did this on purpose dine and hang out with the ones others thought shouldn't be allowed in. In fact, you know, Jesus often used the imagery of a table, a banquet table filled with people who weren't used to being invited in. And he was just repeating what we can find through stories Throughout all of Holy Scripture, where the kingdom of heaven is, is often described as a great feast where, where everyone is invited. Even the least of these he so often identified with. Inviting people in was, was part of life. It's what made life. You know, all the way from Abraham and Sarah inviting those three strangers into their tent and preparing a meal for them. We have stories of King David inviting former adversaries, you know, enemies into his royal banquet tent. And, and then we have, of course, the story of that wayward son, the prodigal son that went off and lived a wild life. But when he went home to his father, his father ran to him and prepared the biggest feast ever. There are stories Jesus told about important people, very important people, rich people, people others admired, who prepared a banquet and invited all their other important people friends, but who one by one sent back a you know, a, a, a reply that they couldn't come, they're too busy, thanks, but no thanks. Then that story continues that that person then sends that invitation out to all the people who you normally wouldn't invite to the feast. He says, hey, well, if my friends won't come, let me invite these other ones, the lonely ones, the poor, the sick, the homeless, the ones who, when they do receive that invitation, they accept it and go to the banquet. For they are the ones others used to try to keep out. If for no other reason, they might bring shame and public ridicule upon themselves. I mean, what would our neighbors think if people like that came around? What would the good people of the local synagogue think or the local church if we started doing that? And after all, weren't they all drunkards and sinners, drug addicts and thieves? And yet, these are the people Jesus was attracted to. And the ones he brought with him to the parties as his plus one. I love the wording of today's gospel about Jesus attending dinner at, at Matthew's house. Matthew, of course, if you remember, was, was, he was one of the people that no one liked. You know, he was so despised, you know, complete outcast in his community. You know, he was a tax collector. We don't like tax collectors either. But it was different in Jesus' day. I mean, 
if you collected taxes back then and you were Jewish, you were working for the Roman Empire, you know, defending Caesar, who other people thought was a god. It was just bad all the way around. But there's Jesus calling Matthew to follow him and then going over to his house for dinner. But then something happens. The Pharisees come. You know, the people who are all uprighteous and important, the famous ones in town. And they look at this dinner with, with Matthew, this horrible person. And then here's the part I love. And all these other notorious sinners who have been invited to come in, just sitting around with Jesus. Jesus and notorious sinners. And when those good old boys showed up, the ones who thought these dinners were only for them, well, boy, did that ever uh, make them mad. Angry at how good food was being wasted on such undesirables. You know, how such hospitality and kindness might, might make these people think they should come back. How dare Jesus not only attend such a wicked gathering, but bring others in with him. especially all those notorious sinners of the day. I just love that. I always get a little chuckle when I read that. Because there's a lot of people who have thought that I am such a sinner. Now, I do have to admit, back in the day, I was pretty good at being one of those sinners. Much more sinner than saint, that's for sure. When people found out what I was doing on my spare time, I was quickly dropped off many an invitation list. Quickly added to some others, though. <laughs> but I never considered myself notorious in my sinning. That would have been quite an honor, actually. I always thought I'd be more like the tax collector and, and the drunks that came with, you know, maybe a few other things thrown in here and there they could dig up on me. But notorious... Well, I never thought I was that good. You know, I looked up the word notorious this morning just to get an idea of, you know, all the things that it can mean. I mean, we normally hear the word notorious and think something awful and bad, like, you know, notorious gangsters or something. But it can also mean celebrated and renowned, fabled and legendary, prominent and admired, now, that's some sinning I can wrap my head around. Matter of fact, that was some sinning Jesus wrapped himself around. Because what he saw in these people was the spark of light ignited by the Spirit of God in them. What he saw were people who others spent a great deal of time and energy trying to extinguish that light. What he saw and what he meant to protect were children of God who were being abused and despised by the ones who thought they were the grown-ups. The ones and, and only ones, you know, who could make the rules of who was valuable in God's sight and who was not. And Jesus, oh, sinner-loving Jesus, he said, no way. You don't get to do that. Only my Father in heaven can do that. And besides, when God did ask you to do that, you got it all wrong. Matter of fact, you did the exact opposite of what God wanted you to do. Paul talked about this this morning when he, he said how Abraham and, and Sarah, how they became God's good friends. Not by adhering to a list of laws, but simply by their faith. When you hear the word law in this context, the Bible context, you have to remember that what's being talked about are the books of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, where all those laws were given to, um, so the Israelites would know how to live and, 
you know, treat one another, and you know, most of them were good. Abraham and Sarah, however, they didn't, they didn't have this list. They didn't have any of that. What they had was faith. They had faith that God was with them, that God cared for them, and that God would be with them wherever they might go. And Paul, Paul, he knew about, he knew this. And he distinctly said this morning, you know, that law only brings wrath. And that faith brings harmony. I'm not suggesting y'all go out now and break the law. I'm suggesting that what other people say is good and bad, evil and and virtuous and notorious and sinful, you know, these things, these definitions, these labels, they may not be at all what God intended. They may not be at all what God intends for us to be called. And these people, these ones labeled all these things, those whom I'm squarely in the middle of, it's nice that, you know, there's some places we're no longer kept out because the door that used to be closed has suddenly swung wide open. The gate that used to be locked is now manned by someone else. We know him, Jesus, calls himself the gatekeeper. And the ones Jesus lets in surprises and angers all sorts of people. The notorious, the well-known, the tax collectors, the drunkards, the prostitutes, the destitute, the drug addict, the despondent, the hungry, the poor, the homeless, the street people, the gays and the lesbians, the divorced and then the remarried, the unmarried and the pregnant notoriously living with one another. When we open the gates of our hearts and the eyes of our souls, We will hear Jesus and see him calling us to the table. You know, we can take pride that our our table is open. We make a big deal of that. We can take pride in it. Matter of fact, this is Pride Month, isn't it? The time when many of us get to show ourselves in public. You know, right out there in public as the people God created us to be. For the ones that are finally called to the table. The notorious ones who have dared build sanctuaries where we we may give thanks to the God of our ancestors. Give thanks to the one who admires the faithful over the record keepers the one who sees beauty in all of his creations, including you and me, rather than the ugliness others often describe us. In 1968, the Reverend Troy Perry, a notorious sinner, by the way, had been cast out of his community, his family, and especially where his church, where he was once a preacher, Troy Perry founded MCC, a community of churches, a family of God for whom all those other notorious ones would be invited in. And that's actually what, exactly what God told him to do, what God led him to do. Not because he now had a different kind of rule book, but because he had faith. There is one rule, actually, in MCC. And that is each and every church has to celebrate a complete and full open communion table 
where everyone is invited to come. No hurdles to jump through, no clothes that don't have holes in them, no past or present that brings out the eye or another's, no sobriety test or test of your morality, no morality clauses that you didn't even know you had. Everyone, every single one of God's beloved children is invited to join in this meal that gives us God's love and grace to go out and live one more week. I mean, this was the meal that was given to us by Jesus, who himself had been excluded by others. And that actually is the part of the story that we should go out and tell today. Not that we have a narrow list of people that can come in, but a great expanse that has seats for everyone and places at the table for every single person. You don't have to be in communion with anybody. You don't have to belong to the right church. You, you know, as we say every week, you don't have to belong to any church to come. The only thing we have to do is accept that invitation when it is given. That's what faith and grace are all about. Which, I just thought of that. Perhaps that's why we call it grace every time we sit down to a meal. That prayer to give thanks to God for giving us everything we need. Will you pray with me, please? Dearest God, you have placed us in this world to live fully as your children, to live life to its fullest, and to accept the invitation you continue to extend through the life and the example of your Son, Jesus. And in accepting your love for us, we dedicate ourselves to bringing that loving feeling to those who are still denied and shut out, categorized and demonized. Help us to heal this world so that the taste of heaven can be found at your table, where we all may sing your praise. In your holy name we pray, amen. My friends, let us take now just a moment of silence and allow this love of God to take over us.